changes that I didn't, it's, I, it's, it's my fault. Um, I, I think completely misunderstood what Rebecca told me. I don't remember what month, but they were back there somewhere. Um, about Marshall's availability this evening. He's actually not available in August at this point. He will be available in September. And that was my fault. I My memory, I don't know. <laughs> There's nothing more to say. I'm sorry. So it will keep tonight's um, meeting to a certainly or could um result in some brevity um which is, of course not is not a bad thing um as you'll recall i believe i wrote this in the agenda um representative lalande can't join us until 7 15. so my recommendation would be why don't we get started if we got to a point where we're kind of like okay we've talked this through if we don't have something else to talk through everybody go get water or you know, ice cream or Oreos or something. And um, then at 7.15, we'll come on and Representative Lalonde will be here. I'm sorry for this. This was, as I say, I just misunderstood Rebecca entirely. And I do apologize for that. Um, let us begin with introductions. I'll go through my Hollywood Squares matrix and start with Elizabeth Morris. Could you introduce yourself just with a sentence or so? Yeah, happy to do so. I'm Elizabeth Morris. I am the Juvenile Justice Coordinator at Family Services Division, um, and I work with Tyler, and, but I am not the designee for DCF. Thank you. And this is the this is really fun because next person um, actually fits in with the announcements that I have, which is to say that Chief Stevens has resigned from the RDAP, and the Attorney General has appointed someone in his stead, and that is the per next person to introduce themselves, and that would be Dale Manning. Dale, please introduce yourself. Good evening, everybody. I'm Dale Manning, um, retired from the state of Vermont Capitol Police after 20 years, uh, retired as a sergeant. I'm now working part time for Meals on Wheels, Lamoille County, still serving the community. Um, I'm a citizen of the Mohegan Band of the Kosuk Abnaki Nation, and I also sit on tribal council. Great. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Great. Tyler, you're next. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tyler Allen. I am the Family Services Division Adolescent Service Director. Um, I uh, I am the commissioner-designated appointee for the Department for Children and Families. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Great. Rebecca. Good to see everyone, and welcome, uh, Dale Manning. It's nice to meet you. I, I am uh, the head, I'm the appellate de uh, defender at the Office of the Defender General and the Defender General's designee on this panel. Great, great. Tiffany? Hi, hi good evening. Uh, Tiffany North-Reed from the Office of Racial Equity, uh, Division of Racial Justice Statistics. I'm the ma uh, data manager for uh, this new division and um, yeah, we're looking to identify and sources of uh, criminal legal data. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with ADS in terms of identifying data sources. Hopefully we will uh, be able to dashboard at, at some point in time, but um, RDAP, of course, is our, our uh, guiding <laughs> advisory kind of board in terms of the work that we need to do. So um, it's always a pleasure to be a part of these meetings. Great. Thank you. Julio. Uh, good, good evening, everybody. I'm Julio Thompson. I'm an assistant attorney general, uh, co-director of the Civil Rights Unit, and I am the attorney general's designee uh, for the meeting tonight. Great. Judge Morrissey. Hi, everybody. My name is Mary Morrissey. I'm a Vermont Superior Court judge currently presiding in Lamoille County. 
excuse me, that I'm the judiciary's designee. Right. Derek. Do you want me to go on? Okay, I'll go on. Laura? <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Laura Carter. I am a um, <clears throat> data analyst within the Division of Racial Justice Statistics, which is in the Office of Racial Equity. Great. Daniel. Daniel? Oh. Yeah, without fail. I'm at a traffic crash here, but my name is Dan Bennett. I'm with Vermont State Police. I work with Aton. I'm going to do my best to follow along, but I am on a uh, shift here. I work for the Fair and Impartial Policing Unit. Thank you. <laughs> Life's exciting. Uh, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I was very poorly trying to jump from one device onto my computer and uh, couldn't quite manage speaking and finding how to speak at that time. Uh, Derek Miedevnik. Community and Restorative Justice Executive with the Vermont Department of Corrections, and I serve as Commissioner Demel's designee to her dad. And um, welcome, Dale. I have many memories of seeing you, as I'm sure many folks do, uh, and many trips to the State House. So thanks for all your service there, and thanks for your service here. Thank you for your support. Thanks. Susanna. Hi, good evening, everybody. Susanna Davis, uh, Office of Racial Equity. I am here as an RDAP member, and I'm also going to be assisting with timekeeping for tonight's meeting. So please don't take it personally. Uh, you well. We got most of it. Thank you. Jen Burpo. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is Jen Furpo. I am the designee for the executive director of the, of the Vermont Police Academy, and happy to be here. Great. Representative Arsenault. Hello, everyone. I'm a representative of Angela Arsenault from Williston. I serve on House Judiciary. Um, I'm not a panel member, but I am uh, always happy to listen and, and occasion to participate which might be the case tonight so yes um, thank you <laughs> great thank you sheila good evening everyone uh sheila linton she her her pronouns a panel member and co-founder and executive director of the root social justice center great and lastly lauren higby Hi, everyone. Oh. Uh, Lauren Hickby, Deputy Advocate with the Office of the Child, Youth and Family Advocate. Um, it is dinner time, so I'm trying to participate. <laughs> and so, yes. Thank you for your flexibility in our attendance. I'm not a panel member, but much like everyone said, happy to participate. Great. Thank you. All right. Um the announcement uh, or no approval of the june minutes um any discussion of them i'm hoping everyone read them june was a while ago i just want to say again like wow like doing the most with the minutes get it <laughs> wasn't that amazing i know i was like he sent them to me and i was like grant my god at? let's give grant some snaps i know Yo. i know <laughs> like, like like yeah all he need to do is some braille and we set to go but um <laughs> um say thank you and and it shows whose cameras are on and off <laughs> that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> oh lord so anybody got anything that they want changed or anything of that nature grant's unfortunately going to be taking the minutes tonight after the meeting he'll look at this and he'll he'll write them up for us he's done that before so he had something come up i know it feels like february if you tell me it's august i'm gonna be like no 
Um, so nothing on the minutes. Would someone like to make a motion then? I can make a mo I can make a motion to approve the June. Um, can somebody give me the date? I'm sorry. Uh, give me a sec. Eleventh. Yeah. June eleventh. Um, our DAP mi minute meetings. Great. Meeting minutes. <laughs> I uh, second the motion. Oh, yeah. uh, Great. All in favor, please signify in some interesting way. Aye. Aye. Good. All opposed? Todd, All I'm, just, I'm, I'm just going to abstain because I wasn't at the June meeting because I was in training. So. Right, right. <laughs> I'm just getting to the abstention. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Um, all abstaining. Got it. I'll abstain this is as Susanna, well. I'm, sorry, this is Susanna myself as well. And Susanna's abstaining as well. All right. And Thank Jen Furpo. You. I'm sorry. Yeah, Jen. It, I right, Jen Furpo. Okay. Glad we said this verbally because we'll need it for um for Grant, but they do pass. They do pass as submitted. So thank you. Okay, announcements. Jess Brown will not be able to join us tonight. Um, I'm not sure exactly what came up, but she's got something. She'll be here in September. We have already met Dale Manning. That was the biggest announcement. Um, otherwise, I have none. I have none. Anyone have any that they would like to share? Seeing none. All right. Let us launch forward into our. Uh... I'll, I'll do an announcement. AR. Go for it. OK, so the Root Social Justice Center is having our back to school BIPOC hair clinic. Boop, boop, boop. So it is free um, for those who identify as BIPOC. If you don't know what that is, you probably shouldn't be on this panel. Okay. Um, and. <laughs> And it's going to be amazing and awesome. Um, we are prioritizing our youth in that. And we had a very successful one last year, which served dozens and dozens of youth across the state who were desperately needing to get their hair done. Because if you don't know about black hair and getting your hair done here in Vermont, it's very hard and difficult. The other announcement that I want to make is that in September, we are going to be having a community sports event. Um, we have a new branch of the Root Social Justice Center. I encourage you to go to our website. It will be updated soon. Or go to our socials if you're on there, Facebook, Instagram. And we have a new program called ARC, which is Asylum Seeker, um, Asylum Seeker Refugee Immigrant Community Program. And um, we have a person from um, the refugee community, specifically from the Congo, who is leading that program and organizing those communities. And we will be having a big sports event. So it'll be like Brattleboro Olympics, really miniature, <laughs> um, here in September, September 28th. And the whole community is invited to join us and celebrate not only um, community members who may be new, um, but also those who have been here for a long time and who've been invisibilized. So if you want to mm -hmm. come and hang out with us and enjoy some sports, um, come on down to Brattleboro. Great. Thanks, Sheila. Sheila, send the flyer if you've got a flyer, and I'll like start distributing in my networks. Cool. We have a saved a date right now. Um, okay. And get a flyer, flyer. I'll make sure to send it out on the email or do something of that sort. Right. Great. Thank you. Well, that's fun. Anybody else? No. Okay. Oh, Julio. Well, I wasn't planning on an announcement, but uh, after hearing. Sheila talk about that clinic, which I've seen that before. So I think that's that's really great. Now, we would like to see a, a copy of that as well. Just a reminder for some of the folks here, uh, effective July 1st of this year, Vermont state law um, prohibits employers from discriminating, discriminating against employees or job applicants on the basis of their hairstyles in Vermont's version of the Crown Act. And uh, uh, Representative Arsenault is here, and so it, she was part of part of that uh, effort that was in the legislature that essentially sailed through. Um, we were glad to have it, and long overdue. So I'm glad to see that uh, there's additional support coming down from uh, Wyndham County from Sheila. So thanks for that. Great. Okay. Um, let us get on with it. Um, 
the continuation of the discussion concerning DCF and the proposed facility in Virgins obviously is tabled um, until next month. It will retain its same place. Um, so I, if anyone's got anything they want to add to this, this would be the time for it. But what we were going to do was listen to another point of view on this. Um, and we don't have that tonight. So I guess I'd say if you've got anything you want to add here, it should probably be very general. But uh, floor is open for anyone who's got something here. Hi, Aton, it's Sheila. Yeah. Because um, I know sometimes until I talk, you might not see me. Um, so I'm... I'm I'm just one I'm slightly annoyed of how long it's taking to have this conversation, especially as a person who brought it up months ago and just should be on the table as it is. So I just want to express my frustrations with that. Um, and usually I'm on vacation now and I am. And one of the reasons why I wanted to show up is because of this conversation. So double whammy for me. Um, and um, that sucks. Um, and, um, I'm kind of curious that you might have answered the question. You might not have more details, but because it's been so long, I have forgotten what is actually going to be presented to us or, or supposedly going to be presented to us. So I'm a little bit curious of, you know, what direction of the conversation other than the virgins, um, or if it's, if that's just the conversation about the virgins, um, facility, and that's what we're talking about when we talk with DCF and it's very focused on that. Or is there more to it than that? So I just wanted to clarify that so we can all be prepared for September. Because I, I was little... okay. And then and then with that, you know, the where you know there are there have been different individuals and groups that have been um participating as Tyler knows and not wanting these stops and understanding like what you know what is actually going through, what is policy, is people taking, you know testimonies or a hearing from other people around this still is sort of a question that I have as well. I guess all I can do is repeat, I'm sorry, because I misunderstood a conversation that happened, I don't know, three or four months ago now. Um, I, um, I think what happened, the reason it's taking such a long time, I believe, is that it's summer. And after what was a particularly bruising session, I think, um, people are taking time in the summer. And so they're on vacations and things like that. And it's difficult to pull this together. I certainly got in touch with... Um, Representative Arsenault and Representative Lalonde about this long, I mean, a, a while ago now, to make sure that they were going to be able to be here for this. I didn't get in touch with Rebecca and with um, Marshall because I just mistakenly assumed that that was set for this month, but it wasn't. It was set for September because of vacations. So again, I apologize. Tyler, you had your hand up first. I did. Thank you, uh, Eitan. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that we did have uh, start this conversation a couple months back. Deputy Commissioner Erica Radke came uh, to the RDAP. We had a conversation about the rest stop. We also talked about the facility of Virgens. I think there was a follow-up. We wanted to um, take in the perspective from the Den uh, Defender General's office, and that was about getting Marshall Paul in. So that's, I think that is a next step. We are still here. We're still prepared to um, have have conversations as they come up and as they're appropriate to the agenda. Um, I also had a little bit of new news related to this. Uh, not news, I guess, but uh, kind of an ask of the RDAP. Um, I debated, is this something I should bring up in the new business at the beginning? But I'll just kind of share it now. There is a facility planning stakeholders working group uh, that's a public working group to discuss matters related to the um, secure any development of a secure facility. Um, but one of the challenges, there's many perspectives in that room, and it's sometimes hard to get focused conversations around some of the critical elements of what a facility develop development looks like. And so I am trying to pull together mixed perspective um, working groups to kind of chunk out some of the 
conversations that we've already begun and been having in here. So I just like really quickly, and I'm sorry, I don't have them up in my head. So I'm, I'm gonna pull them out of my head because I don't have them in front of me. There's, there's five working groups that I'm trying to pull together and I'd invite anybody who's interested to reach out to me via email um, to participate in those. Those working groups specifically, one of them has to do with um, the plant design. So the physical design of the structure, what the ideal needs of that have to do with. That's a working group that I'd like to have uh, a very active up front, um, particularly active up front, because the longer we work on design elements, the farther out that, um, or the, the harder it is to get design elements built in. The second working group has to do with due process. This is entry into the program, what it looks like. This is the legal process by which a person can be placed in a secure facility. Um, so we wanna make sure that that's well uh, represented. I think in particular, the, and I know Marshall's aware of all these groups, but that'd be an area that I think the Defender General would wanna have representation. Uh, another what would be programs, uh, what's happening within the program itself. Those are the educational components. Those are the therapeutic uh, components, what the re recreational curriculum and, and uh, schedule looks like. Um, that would be what's happening by way of services in this building in, in, in the future. Um, the next has to do with oversight. So what is um, the requirements of just maintaining licensure, and all of that, and how is the how is the program being overseen? That also can speak to what public facing reports and data come out of this. And then the last group is youth engagement strategy. So different ideas on how do we bring in youth voice, not only into this part of the process, but the process throughout building structure. So getting together people that are interested and motivated to like, how do we make sure that it's a youth driven process? So those are five smaller working groups that I'm trying to put together. I've had uh, limited people reach out to me, but I thought this group might be a fertile ground for people who are interested in some of those. So I'm sure those will be listed out in the minutes by Grant, um, but please reach out to me if you'd like to participate in any of those groups. Tyler, um, I think a question that I would have just, and I think it's important as you finish your presentation there, will these be meetings that are in person or are they gonna be online or are they hybrid? It's a great question. These would be online meetings um, okay. specifically. And the way it will work is these groups are just informal working groups. They're designed to come up with specific tasks and recommendations. This is what our best thinking was. Anything that comes out of those groups would then be brought into the public facility planning stakeholders group so that they have something substantial to chew on. Um, all at once. So the, the process is still to have the, the facility planning working group be the overseeing group that actually talks about these, but to have the work carried a little farther in specific chunks is um, uh, hopefully just an effort to streamline conversation. I was actually inspired by this group um, and how we organized the subcommittees in previous years uh, towards that idea. So thank you, Eitan, and all of you for that. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Thanks. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, yes, so that was a mix up and Aton's gracious to take uh, full blame, but I, 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 I don't know where the communications that I'm, I'm take responsibility to. Either way, July was my vacation. August is Marshall's vacation. And he's the you know you've you've heard him speak. He's a juvenile defender and is the expert on all these issues. That said, I appreciate Sheila's return to what has become lost from our perspective. Uh, and in fact, in ahead of what we thought was going to be next month's presentation, I was going to go through the minutes because I was not here in May, had to leave early in June. And I am, am lost even hearing um, Tyler, what you're talking about. Because uh, rest stop is different from the uh, discussion of the secure facility, and I'm not sure, you know, I'm not prepared to describe the difference. Uh, I'm not sure what the ask is, in fact, and um, if, if if people aren't prepared to, to say that now, uh, to share that ahead, um, and we can um, better prepare for next month. I think my understanding was that we were just given space to respond generally to DCF's various presentations, but because I have missed those, uh, uh, much of them, I, I was going to go through the minutes and then connect back to find out. That was my understanding as well, but that's me, 
Sheila. Um, thanks for that, Rebecca. Um, so <laughs> I thought I was a little confused. Now I think I'm more confused than I than I was before after Rebecca said what she said. Um, so we're talking about two different things here. We're talking about a rest stop and a secure facility. Thank you, Rebecca. Like that that's what I meant by what are we talking about? Because I didn't realize that either. And that was one of the questions I was gonna ask, because are these working groups for the rest stop of their secured facility? It sounds like the secured facility. And it, it sounds like the rest stop's a done deal. Um and that um and that this is for how not to mess up again, like like to to make people get on all these subcommittees to have no teeth to give information to another group who has the power to make the decisions to hopefully not create another rest stop i mean that's my hope and then and then i'm just i'm and, and then i'm just wondering is there a working group to abolish or to deconstruct or to restore I mean, there's five great groups that had wonderful titles, and I and I I appreciate that there was inf inspiration from this group. But what about the group who doesn't want those systems at all? What about that group of people who who I know you've been personally present to hear stories from, and and who want to not plan of what the next lockdown facility is going to look like and how beautiful it can be, but how can we actually change the culture? of what we're doing to our youth. So I'm just all confused or maybe I'm not confused. And so maybe I'm just angry. Tyler. Hi, I'm happy to provide some response here. Um, so yeah, when we originally talked about it, there were two conversations on the table. One was the question about the rest stop, what that means, what that practice is, how that's happening. Um, the other the, was the question around the development of secure facilities. Those are two separate things. Um, the rest stop is a practice that's been in place now for about uh, a year and a half, two years. Um, it's a practice supported by no one, I would say. Um, it's something born out of necessity. We discussed that in greater detail in this group a couple months ago. Um, we had less time to get into secure facility. And I think part of the hope when I was saying because originally I was saying we should do these over two separate times. And then it kind of the feedback back was it's kind of lumped together. The two are their, their, their similarity. So let's talk about all. So we did talk about all a couple of months ago, but most of the focus of the conversation was a rest stop for clarity for folks in the group, particularly new folks. The rest stop is a practice that DCF, you, or the rest stop is a one bedroom that DCF has access to. And the practice around the rest stop is what we refer to as alternative setting. So when we have a young person in an emergency moment that has no placement, there is no foster care placement, there's no available community placement, there's no kin placement, there's no residential placement, for whatever reason, we're in a pl placement crisis in a moment, um, the rest stop is a place where we can staff with family, family services workers around the clock to have a youth in that place. The reason that I say that this is um, fundamentally problematic uh, as an approach is multifaceted. One of the, um, but but the primary concern of that is when a when a youth is in an alternative setting, there is no structure, there is no therapeutic structure built into it, there is no licensure attached to that program. It's not. It's just literally a holding place where you have. Um, professionals who are not who are doing a job other than the job that's described to them to do staffing a kid out of urgent necessity for lack of a better word dcf doesn't want to do this practice we don't believe it's good for kids it's cumbersome um, universally um, it's problematic it puts our staff at risk it's uh it's not good for anybody so we don't want this to be a practice it is um has been a reality of the situation um for a number of reasons. Um, and so while we work on efforts to right size the system of care, get in the other conversations we're having, that's what the rest stop conversation was, was and is about. The secure facility planning is to say, um, DCF uh, and the agency is 
under the belief that a secure facility is required for the state of Vermont and making a determination of how big that is, what happens in that facility and how it's overseen are uh, critically important because Vermont has some dark history that doesn't go back very far around youth in a secure placement. So we want to make sure that though we believe there is necessity for that situation or that that type of facility to happen, we want to make sure it's done thoughtfully and engaging the voice of this group and the, the group, uh, the facility planning group is critically important. They're not the, I just do want to say the working groups that I'm talking about, they're not toothless in my opinion. My opinion is to craft concrete conversations that we can bring to a public forum and have vetted and voted and approved upon by a group that does have um, some capacity to connect to the legislature, connect to others. We wanna make sure that's heard and we wanna make sure that information is publicly available to anybody who's interested in the question. There needs to be representation from the community that we're planning around this. There needs to be representation from those who are who have been impacted, whose families have been impacted or may be impacted. It needs to be, as I said before, youth focused and all of those things. So it's really just about trying to organize the work at this point to make sure we have the best facility we can. Um, I think it's a fine idea to have a working group of people uh, to coordinate their efforts saying why we don't need to have these facilities. Um, I'd be happy to participate in that if people have questions about how to do that. I understand that is the perspective of many that we should not have any secure placement in the state. I believe that there are limitations, there are consequences to young people who go into our systems. Um, Particularly, my concern is that they're young people who may be more likely to be served by the adult criminal justice system for lack of appropriate juvenile justice system response. So I want to be really flexible in what the juvenile justice system can provide to young people, but lacking the capacity to serve specific needs, I fear what other alternatives are out there that might put young people at risk. So, I mean, I think that's the best I can answer. I do hear your concern, Sheila, and I'm that I'm not I'm not trying to bait. I'm not trying to make anger. We are. I am genuinely trying to get the best thing uh, that we can get um, for the kids that were served. Okay. Lauren, thanks. Um, I I just wanted to echo what Sheila said because um, it was very. <laughs> You went, oh, okay. Continue without me, thanks. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I guess my question would be, Sheila, are, would it matter to you at all or an address? Oh, go ahead, you have your hand up. No, you can ask, finish your question. Um, I would it make any difference at all if there were a working group that was working on that particular issue? I, I personally think it was. I think it gives a much more rounded perspective of what we're talking about because, you know, as we, you know, there's a few things that I heard from you, Tyler, and I want to make sure that I understood. Um, I I understood a couple of things. One, I think I heard you say that there's a law in Vermont that says that we have to have a facility like this or a policy or something. Did you say something to that, to that sort of that, that there is something that's saying we need to have this in our state? It sounded there. like. To me. There is no law that dictates that a juvenile needs to be held securely within our state. There, there or is that not. we need to have a facility like this in our state. There, there is, there is, um, there is people, and the department is of an understanding that such a facility is needed. Okay, but there's no law right. or policy saying that we have to have something like this in the state of Vermont. There is no law that says we have to have a sec any secure placement. Uh, to my knowledge, for juveniles in the state. Okay. And so, yeah, so I just wonder about re-envisioning, reimagining what what can be, because if we don't give those opportunities, then we never know what can be. 
And we need to put those on quote unquote equal footing of those other groups in order to have that and not a, like a side thing with that. So um, that is one thought I have. Another thought is, um, you know, something I heard you say, Tyler, I believe, and everybody can go look at the video later, but you mentioned fear and when you were talking and the fear of what could be if we don't have something like this and the fear of what could be if we the joys of it, if we didn't have this or you know when we operate from a place of fear which i know is very very real and as a person of color living in vermont i can tell you it's more real than you'll probably ever imagine um it's really hard to make the right decisions and um because it messes us all up everyone up right and so i just offer you know a different way of looking at things and a different way of operating when we operate from that sense of fear when we have that embedded with us when we've been coached to think that if we don't do this this will happen there'll be a bunch of kids on the wild and killing people or something like i, I don't know what we think is going to happen or there'll be that one youth left out um and and maybe they'll harm this i'm not sure but what I am sure of is that stuff is already happening <laughs> with lock facilities. What I am sure of is all this stuff happens right now. And so if that stuff is happening right now and we're in fear, then maybe there's an opportunity for something different um, and an opportunity for us to imagine and envision and not be fear be our driving force. And I'm not saying that necessarily as an individual, you may hold that fear yourself personally, but as a society, we hold that. We all fear things, right? And that's just real. And I don't wanna um, take away from that, but I just wanna offer us a new way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. may, I just, may I just, I'll say one more thing in response, just to clarify where I was coming from. Currently, Vermont is the only state in the country that has not a single secure bed for any youth. There is there is no secure bed in Vermont. So it's not it, it is a reality of our current situation. One um, wonderful thing about that is we do have an understanding that we can we currently don't have such a thing. I will say that I am in the position to see some of the unintended consequence of that. It was not thoughtfully that we don't have that. Woodside uh, was closed for thoughtful purposes um, and was correctly closed for thoughtful purposes, but having no secure facility was never thoughtfully part of the plan. In fact, it had been considered and intended and it had uh, and it had been pointed out of what what could happen, what what the what you know what negative could happen. And there are instances where I believe that young people, many young people are not getting the care they need for lack of it. So it's not a fear of what could be, it is a fear of continuing what currently is, that is, is the fear thing I'm talking about. That being said, 100%, Sheila, I agree with you. 100% I'm with you. The other is really where the conversation should be happening. It's far beyond, when we're talking about secure, I mean, Developing a secure facility is a big deal and it's important and we need to have all eyes on it and we need to be really thoughtful and we need to put lots of guardrails in place so that abuses of the past are not continued um, and more. That being said, the vast majority of our solutions are in community engagement, are in community level placements, it's in providing supports to families, it's about expanding foster care, prevention service, restorative justice programming. So all of those things are things that DCF also does and is continuing to advance and move forward on. The secure facility is a very small part of the service array that we believe is necessary to provide for young people that warrants a great deal of attention to make sure it's done correctly. So I'm just putting it out there because I, I do really hear um, the concern in your voice and other people's voice. And I really want to match that and make sure we're being responsive to that. Um, and there is a lot more other at stake. And I think we have a bunch of working groups dedicated to those things. And I think we need more too. There needs to be more effort. Um, and we need more community involvement on every layer of this. 
I'm really talking about a small part of what we believe is a, a necessary service array. Great. Thanks, Tyler. Lauren, you're 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 able to now go for it. It remains to be seen, but I think so. Um, thank you, everyone, for your patience. Uh, it's a tricky time. Um, I I struggle of of where to start. Um, I think I'll start with Sheila's idea um, because I'm coming off of this kids' call today with UVM Medical Center, and what I think I was shocked to hear was that. The UVM children psychiatry and social worker in the ED are really saying the solution is to deinstitutionalize the services for adolescents, and to and to hear that from the medical model was shocking and in really a breath of fresh air. So, um, if there are ways that we can also hold the alternatives to detention settings um, in equal footing, um, I, I think that's where we need to go because I haven't seen that dedication. And I'm not placing blame because it is a massive system at work here. Um, and then a, a few other things that I think we have to identify is <laughs> Woodside wasn't closed thoughtfully. As, as a person who was in Woodside, who wrote those regulatory reports, who wrote those investigations, Woodside was closed because of egregious harm to children. And that's what Vermont's narrative needs to say. That's what it needs to be. Um, and so as Vermont, without a locked facility, without a detention facility, I would also like to ask how many other detention facilities have lawsuits? The states that currently have functioning facilities are under thousands and thousands of lawsuits because we know this model doesn't work. And so I'll stop there. Okay. And thank you. <laughs> so it sounds to me as though what we're needing is just what so, uh, the inauguration of another one of these working groups that is specifically about the counter um proposal a counter I, i'm not speaking well i'm sorry headaches make it hard um alternatives to youth incarceration something like yes thank that's what you what the sentencing project calls it <laughs> got it got it um thank you that sounds like, and that is something that you've already said. You said that, didn't you, Tyler, that that was one of the groups? It wasn't one of the groups, it's one of the oh. services. So Balanced and Restorative Justice is the DCF contracts that oversee practices that have to do with, you know, it's more of a diversionary and restorative approach. It's a community-based approach to doing this where individuals can remain in their home. Um, sure. It's how do we address delinquency concerns through non you know, non non institutionalization, I should say, categorically a different, newer, better way of doing things on the preventative front of things. I I I I'm struggling to figure out how the the balanced group would work. The the, oppo the opposition to this, it makes sense to have a group that's focused on alternatives to incarceration. Um, we're framing our program. We're trying to build a program to be grounded in therapeutic modality as opposed to detention and carceral practice. Um, that being said, forming a group that's just about don't do that. I don't know what we can do with that. Um, but where Sheila was guiding us, and I think where you're kind of pointing us to, Lauren, which is what can we do otherwise, I think that I'm excited to be part of that group. I'm excited to lean into that group. I'm, I, I would, I'd love to be part of those practices. Um, so, you know, where, where, where we can be solutions focused, I think we can get a lot done. Okay. Uh, Rebecca, you had your hand up. Uh uh, I took it down right when you said it. Oh, I just, sorry. Bonus uh, point to time check and a chat, but I just wanted yes. to say I, I was taking notes. I listened, on, and we will be prepared 
to sort of provide the defender generals and um, specifically the juvenile defenders uh, perspective on the points that Tyler made. And perhaps then, although I don't want to delay anything if people want to set up a working group now, um, but we will be prepared next month to okay. talk about both the rest stop and the uh, secure facilities and the okay. alternatives. Sheila, it's not perfect. Does that work for you? This is fine. Thank you. Okay. Great. Elizabeth, and then we have to move on to the next topic. Yeah, and I'll absolutely keep my point very short. It, it, this whole conversation has just been uh, reminding me of a piece that um, I actually came prepared today with, which is that a conversation about disparity data um, when it comes to the youth that are served. Um, and I and I believe that that was an ask at one point, at one meeting, I'd have to look back at the meeting yeah. notes to figure out exactly where that was. But I do think that that's really crucial when we talk about this conversation, particularly for talking about a secure facility and the alternatives and what happens to youth if we don't have a secure juvenile facility. Because to be frank, we do have a juveniles who are charged as adults right now. And those juveniles right now are going into a DOC adult facility. And I can share that data. You can see the race disparities within those youth. And I think the conversation also needs to be really clear about what to do with those youth if we don't have a secure juvenile facility and what's happening to those youth. Um, it's a small number, but those lives are incredibly important to talk about. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay. Um, I'm moving us on, not because this is finished, but because we have a limited amount of time per month um, trying to maximize. I may have been a little hopeful. Um, I wanted to move on to the conversation that we started, well, month before last, um, having to do with the, the possibility of legislation regarding the policy impact assessments. Um, I don't think I need to go over the background for all of this. Um, all I would add is just briefly, and I, I, I think I said this in, in June, um, the session before last, we were, the RDAP was um, in very good odor we were asked about many different things. We were testifying with somewhat alarming frequency, <laughs> um, but it was great because we were really able to put in what our enabling statute asks us to do. What is concerning and to the entire body, and I'm just summing things up here to start the conversation off representative, um, is that, uh, last session was really quite different and sort of alarmingly so because there were so many equity impact how to put that that was wrong there were so many bills that came up that had the potent that enshrined in legislation more moment high impact high discretion moments at which bias can make an entrance into the proceedings um, and we were not asked to testify. We testified once um, in front of House Judiciary. And in fact, I couldn't do the whole part of the testimony because we had not as a panel discussed what was being brought up. Um, you know, it was there was the bill. <laughs> it was 80 pages. People were like looking at me going, you're kidding, right? You're, we're not really doing this. I was like, yeah, by tomorrow. And then everyone's like, yeah, no, we're not doing this. Um, and we really kind of got to a point where it was, these have got to be legislatively enshrined. The process of actually going through the policy impact assessments um, to make sure that when something like this goes on, there's at least some kind of stopgap that would not allow it to become the kind of tsunami that it became of terror this session. Um, it's very hard to work in that, certainly, when you're kind of like putting up your hand going, wait a minute, can we slow down a bit? 
And there was no chance of doing any of that. So that's kind of where we got. That's kind of where we got. And I, my concern, Representative, is that, you know, what are your concerns? What are, you know, what, what can you do? What do you feel you can't do? How can we facilitate what you do? This, you know, all those questions. So I open it up to you. Uh, well, thank you. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that I was speaking with a colleague today and mentioned that I was attending this meeting to talk about the potential for uh, this type of legislation. And um, the first thing she she was in, in full support and said, can, how, how brief can it be? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was just an interesting, I hadn't, I, I hadn't even thought of that. Um, and well, I, it just, it made me realize and everything that I think what I was, I should, I don't want to say everything that transpired or didn't last session. I'll say everything that I was aware of transpiring or not um, seems to really hinge on time and this this crunched um you know we have a relatively short session and there's always like we have to get this through we have to get this through we have to do this all before crossover and this and so and i as i understood it part of the reason that you aton weren't able to give the full testimony was as you said that the panel hadn't met you didn't and you and it's not the sort of thing where you can come in and represent the panel um so I'm really curious about how we address that problem. And I think that's something that representative alone is going right. to speak to. Um, and I have spoken with, with, with representative alone about that as well. Um, and so the idea of legislation to me, my hope is that it would build into the process, right. This very important step. And then, make it a lot harder to say, we just don't have time. Right. Um, it's part of the process. It's part of the, it's, it's an expectation. It's a requirement. Then you change your calculation, you change right. your calendar. Um, and I can understand that it's, I find it frustrating that, that we may have to force that, so to speak. Um, but I'm, I'm, I feel like that, I feel that that's the point we've reached. Um, I would certainly love for um, Representative Christie to be a part of this conversation yeah. um, as someone who's been through the Social Equity Caucus, really trying to um, lift up this I, this uh, very idea, you know, through um, a list of questions that uh, that they made, they had printed out and placed in committee rooms, and you know, noticed between sessions. Um, even in one biennium, the poster kind of ended up somewhere else, somewhere, and we found it and we put it back up in our committee room. But, you know, um, it was quite symbolic, I think. Um, and so someone with a lot more history, I'd like, I'd love for him to be a part of this conversation. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry I didn't get in touch with him. I know he's been ill, so I just... Yeah, no, and I don't... Yes, of course. I, I'm sort of just expressing my right. what, what I... I, I um, want to do everything I can and want to make, leave plenty of space for folks who have way more, um, perspective and, you know, have been fighting this fight for longer than, than, than my two years. So, um, okay. and, and, and coach Christie is who comes to mind as I know that he's really been pushing the social equity caucus version of, um, I, I'll call it the social equity caucus version of an impact assessment tool. Right. Okay. It, I would agree. And I, you know, everybody else feel free to weigh in. I mean, I, I definitely think time has come to say we're building this in no more excuses. Um, cause it, it really, we were all rattled in the BIPOC world by what happened last session. I mean, there, we we put a united front together, and one of the things that I will admit is that we don't all always like each other, right? <laughs> we don't. We don't even agree sometimes. But the fact is, we were all together on this one. This just felt really 
not demeaning. It, it. I think what you're saying, Representative, about that poster is indicative. Mm -hmm. And that may be my, you know, getting older cynicism. But why would you take that poster down? Yeah. Why is equity so bloody terrifying that we can't look at that? Um, and we have been saying, I mean, the BIPOC community has been saying for a long while, the RDAP has been saying um, in, in solidarity with those communities, the idea that, you know, and you've heard this, I know, you know, not about us without us. And yet that really is the banner for last session mm -hmm. was, you know, not about us without us. And it gets to a point where it becomes kind of complicated in that I find personally, people just stop talking mm -hmm. and they just, the they withdraw. Thing. Yeah. They just go, you know, enough. It's not, they don't care. They're not going to care. Um, there's no point. Um, I will admit that my I myself um, was having real trouble thinking of continuing as a member of this panel, let alone as chair. Um, because if, if our reports don't get read, which happened in 2019, um, you know, we wrote a new one this year and submitted in February and God only knows I talked to various legislators and they're like, really? And I'm like, I know you had a long session. It's there, you know, give it a look. They're like, okay. You know, and all right, well, that's sort of a Pyrrhic victory. However, um, I, I mean, we could have avoided a lot of this, I think if this kind of bill did exist, if this kind of law existed that required people to slow down and get input from everybody you need to get input from. I mean, just because BIPOC communities might get quieter doesn't mean they're not enraged. And I think that's important to keep in mind that a lot of people, you know, I mean, you know, everyone knows this. I mean, you get disenfranchised. There comes a point when you just sort of quietly, at least for a while, give up and, you know, don't really say anything, but you're not thinking very pleasant thoughts. And I think that's what's happened here. Yeah. And I wonder, uh, you know, it, it seems to me that this panel being itself um, a creation you know, created by statute, I would look at the type of legislation we're discussing, you know, this this type of requirement that, however it's framed, whether it's, you know, RDAP involvement or um, this, you know, the Office of Racial Equity, this, which really seems like a really great thorough um, impact assessment tool or equity assessment tool, whatever, however it ends up looking, it seems like a natural evolution of the statute that created this panel. Um, yeah. You know, like we talk all the time about tweaking, making, you know, relatively small changes or once you, once you get a statute in out into the, once it's real in the, in the world and not just being talked about in, in a committee room and you realize what you missed. Right. Um, this strikes me as an example of that, yeah. that it, it isn't quite enough to create the panel and ask the charge the panel with doing X, Y, and Z without fully committing as a body to using the information that comes back. Right. Um, and uh, even um, integrating the practices that, that you're maybe even implicitly putting on it or expecting of the panel, you know, that we as committees should all be doing right. having these conversations and doing this type of work. So um, I would, yeah, I would very much like to see a bill like this come together that makes sense to, to you, to all of you to that. And that, um, and that we can feel pretty certain will, will truly be implemented. Okay. Thank you. Rebecca. Uh, Representative Arsenault, thanks for, for being here tonight and, and showing your support for this issue. You see me a lot in the committee room representing the Defender General's office, not as RDAP. Um, 
And so I have shared with this panel my personal experience of last session and how um, how fast things move, how much that that input from from um, racial disparities impact of the bills was was really lacking and incomplete. And as you know, we are often the only office in, in, in the room on a bill talking about it against um, so many. And, and I've shared with this panel that the structure of however these bills get introduced, you talk about time and the time crunch um, and managing um, bills and trying to move them forward, uh, which ones get picked for higher priority or not. I'm not sure how that's done. Um, but either way, there is this pattern of turning to sort of the the same governmental players and um, and the Defender General's office is one of them, um, but that we are often in the room of just government uh, representatives and when we and we're one of the and, and you know, office of, of racial equity is, is there too. Um, but very much drowned out by the several representatives that come in from the various law enforcement um, agencies and that impact. All of which to say um, that when when RDAP is asked, I'm just highlighting what, what Aton shared about the frustration as a panel. As a panel member, uh, it was extraordinarily frustrating both personally, I know how much is required to vet these bills. And, and come back with something thoughtful that we think is useful for the committee from the Defender General's perspective. Our, our, our RDAP is just not physically structured to provide that kind of, of, of timely uh, response and thoughtful response. Um, any, any bill that um, would come out, I would hope was actually going to provide some of that fundamental structure. I do wanna just voice now um, that this today's panel is reflective of sort of our overall structural problem. We have two vacancies, community member vacancies that are still not filled. Uh, and we have had those vacancies for how many months? Uh, we operate on a two hour, once a month total volunteer basis. Um, and, and the government, we, we, we meet at this hour to try to achieve some, some approximate, <laughs> approximate uh, equity, uh, but it's not. And, and, and the compensation to the community members on this panel is just is not as lacking. We've talked about that before, all of which to say, it's hard for me, though, though I support this a thousand percent. And, and I think that's confirmed by what I share with the committee as a representative of the Defender Generals. Uh, the, about supporting and addressing these issues, correcting, addressing racial disparities, correcting and identifying, avoiding future racial disparities and in, in incoming new bills. Uh, of course, I support that. The problem is, is that when we land with something like this in RDAP month, uh, you know, August, few months before, with, without us being fully staffed up, even how we normally are. Uh, no, uh, I understand, Julio, well, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I understood your introduction today to be that you are the designee from the Attorney General just today, uh, but I would love to hear if you have some input as to whether or not there is going to be a, a permanent uh, designee from the Attorney General's office just to help keep some momentum going um, as we as we try to turn to something that I think is the most important, which is trying to put some teeth and weight behind everything that RDAP has done in the past and what we're here to do. Um, sure, I, I can respond to that. Um, so I, I mentioned that I'm the interim appointment uh, when I was asked to, to fill in on the RDEP as the AG's representative. That was after Aaron Jacobson, who was our co-director of our com, uh, com, uh, community justice unit had left to go work uh, in, in the city of Burlington. And uh, the office had been intending to hire someone who was going to work on a lot of policy related initiatives our office has extended an office of the, an office an offer to Todd Delos who has not started in our office I think he's starting after Labor Day and I think that's when we'll have that conversation so uh, you know I'm, I'm here for this meeting and it's really up to the Attorney General to have that um while I've got the mic, so to speak, on the issue of having a racial equity impact, um, uh, you know, assessment of some sort, I, I just point out for maybe at least some of the newer members 
Um, that's not a brand new concept. There are a number of states that have been doing it for years. Some do it where members of the legislature can request that. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily fall on the committee chair to request that, but other members of the legislature could request a, a racial or, and, and sometimes they're called racial and, ec and ethnic equity uh, impact reports. Uh, and then in some cases like um, New Jersey's one that's been doing it, I think it's since at least 2018, it's mandatory for anything that relates to criminal justice in some states like Colorado um, have laws that say if there's any legislation that might affect the population of persons who are in, incarcerated in the state, uh, then there's a mandatory uh, equity impact assessment that has to be provided before the bill can be taken up uh, in a committee. Um, and there are other states, um, uh, I'm thinking of, I think Connecticut uh, has had one where it's done on, uh, it's another request model. The ones that I've seen that I've looked at, and I'm not an expert in this area, but did some reading over the summer because I knew this topic was coming up, is that the laws that have been passed so far seem to house the ec the impact statement in the existing legislative, uh, their version of the Office of Legislative Council. And I think those are in legislatures where they have a full-time legislative operation, which may not correspond to Vermont. What those what those entities do for those impact statements in terms of looking to their versions of RDAP if they have them for, for input, I don't know. Um, but I think that is something that um that you know we could look into. I don't have a view, and I don't think the AG has a view on. You know, if, if there's a model that fits out there, I would just point out to to some of the um, uh, newer members of the public or or to Dale, who's his his, his first uh, um, meeting, is that it, it isn't it isn't a brand new subject. Uh, D.C., uh, Washington D.C. also for many years has had a I think it's called a commission on ra racial equity that has generated numerous, maybe by now dozens of these equity impact statements that are available online. So if people want to take a look at uh, what one looks like, I, I, you know, I don't have them handy here, but I'd be happy to send them on to ATON and maybe for distribution so that people get some sense. The idea here is just simply that it isn't, if the legislature isn't interested in taking up the issue, they don't, they're not really starting from scratch. They might be able to draw inspiration or lessons from them and maybe even in, in the time that's available, talk to people who in those bodies that do those assessments and, and get their sense of what works and what doesn't work. And, and because merely because something's passed somewhere else doesn't mean it works very well. So that's what I'll say. Julio, if you got those together and got them to me, that would be a beautiful mitzvah. So, yeah. Yeah, I would thank you very much for that. I, I was typing some notes as you were talking, but yes, uh, certainly any um, existing statute and anything that we can look to and, and direct ledge counsel towards, you know, if, if, we, if we decide to move forward, that's always helpful. Do we need, do we need to take a vote as to whether we're going to move forward with this or not? That's an open question. To can all the be, panelists. Aton, can you be specific of what the, this is? This would be moving forward with legislation that would require a, as the ORE calls it, policy, policy uh, impact assessment um, must accompany a bill. I mean, tell me the reasons why not, other than time, energy, and effort. Um, which everything takes. So, I have so, no reasons why not. I'm just being the chair. I want to hear. I want to hear from anybody who's like, mm, not now. Why not? Uh, because it just it it's it's way overdue. I mean, it's it's about our values. Right. We have to put forth what our values are, and if our values is 
to represent and to address what we're calling here as equity issues. I just like to call it racism and white supremacy culture, but everybody has their their words they feel comfortable with. Um, then we need to do that. <laughs> so yes, I would be happy. I don't know what teeth that holds. I appreciate um well, you, um, rap and um what you said. Um, but I would I this got brought up in one of our other meetings and I was really excited about it. But I also just want to hear from Susanna just a little bit around if you have knowledge, because I feel like you might have commented on this before in one of our meetings. And I'm just wondering if you, you have any thoughts or any negative thoughts or experiences of how uh, maybe this has been done in other places, but maybe you have insight of how it could have been done better and how Vermont can do it even better than the other states if we like the idea. Yeah, I think you could sense me chomping at the bit over here. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so um, I, I have a whole lot of thoughts. I'm not going to be able to wrap them up in three minutes. But um, the short story is that I do very, very, very strongly support making this mandatory. We have uh, tried to um, work with the legislature on that kind of a thing, but there are a lot of reasons put up why it wouldn't work. The representative already shared what some of those are. Um, and it's not its not for lack of desire by a lot of people, right? I mean, we know that the probing equity questions have existed and are brought up in numerous committee rooms when the chair permits it. Um, but even then it's more conversational and doesn't really go through the analytical rigor um, that might be required for some of these really deep, intricate policies. The other question uh, that's a big one for for this in the legislature is who would be required to complete them? The proposed, you know, the proponent, legislator, leg council. Um, you know, it 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 strikes me that everybody has a different level of expertise and understanding of how to do these kinds of analyses, and leaving it up to people who may not have. Uh, that the ability to do that critical analysis um, may mean that you just get a crummy product, in which case it's it's as if it hadn't been done at all. Um, so I think there are still a lot of outstanding questions that need to be answered, but but it is an it, I I would recommend for what for what my vote counts here. Um, I think that the RDAP should support this kind of legislation. And I do think that we should revisit it as a group in the future. And I think this is probably a good, um, oh, Sheila, so your other question was, um, have I seen it done well in other ju jurisdictions? And um, I guess I'm happy to report that other jurisdictions actually come to us for our tool. So um, I think that probably is a good thing. And um and the last thing that I was going to say was that this is a good time to let you all know that we have uh, we are this close to finishing uh, an update of our tool. And when that happens, we'll be recording another web webinar and actually making this webinar recording in addition to the new form uh, publicly available as well. Right now, we just kind of share it ad hoc to people who ask for it, uh, but we'll be sort of dedicating more prominent space on our website to that with the accompanying things so that it can be used outside of state of Vermont. And so um, I think once it gets finalized, I would be happy to share a new version with you. And and this one, anyway, that's it. That's it. I'm quiet. Yeah. No. So I just want to, I just, and I know I like to repeat myself, but maybe other people need that too, <laughs> or not repeat myself, but repeat what, reflect what was said. So we have this tool, you're updating this tool and the tool you're re re referring to, can you just name the tool? So we're all on the same page. Yeah. Uh, the impact assessment tool or impact. policy impact assessment. And that addresses what areas addresses equity. What What's the tag in that? I'll actually put a link to the current version of it. Again, this is now going to be an outdated version, but just so you can get a sense of it. And what it basically is, is a questionnaire that forces us to ask ourselves questions that will surface whether there are gonna be disparities in the proposal. It'll ask us things like, um, is there regional equity? Are there public facing materials? If so, are they gonna be translated? If not, why not? Could this present a, a racial disparity? Could it present another disparity for another group? Um, what performance measures are you using? Did you get community input when you develop this proposal? proposal was the community itself representative of it. so that kind of thing and that's what it's supposed to surface I'm sorry if that wasn't the the question you were asking no no that that that's the question and you are updating this tool and you're creating a webinar my understanding the webinar is informational educational 
of how to use the tool. I'm assuming mm-hmm. that, excuse me for the background noise. <laughs> um, so can th- not only the tool be required, but the webinar <laughs> to assist with legislature legislators being able to inform themselves of how to use this tool. Um, and I know that's something we sort of talked about here. I know, I know it's, <laughs> I know it's in those minutes, Grant, I'm going to let you know when you come back. But um, I, yeah, can we like not only, okay, so a tool is only as good as you know how to use it. And mm-hmm. we have lots of tools in our lives. It doesn't mean we know how to use them well. And so we could give you the tool. Like if you give me a hammer, I might be able to fix that leg on my thing, but you give somebody else a hammer, they might build a house. You know what I mean? And so we want to make sure that we're not only giving people the right tools, but we're educating them on how to use those tools because then we're just going to replicate the same things with a different tool. And if there's a tool that is also accompanied by a wonderful webinar that can help assist in how to use the tool, why are we not putting that forth too as um, as a component to um, making this happen? So I vote um, that yes, we should have it mandatory. And yes, we should have it required that the tool, whether, I'm, excuse me, I'm not up in what the legislators do, but whenever y'all meet, do whatever you do, whatever you do, or you sit in your bed, chill it out, whatever, I don't care. Do the webinar, like, <laughs> and have some coaching or something, you know? Anyway, I'm wondering, that's what's important to me. It's not just the tool, because that's only as effective as how we use it. And so what's really important in addition to that is making sure that the legislators are open to understanding the value um, in the time and learning how to use this tool appropriately. Sorry to be so long-winded. No, it's fine. Derek, can you give me a moment to just follow up on that and then you can, okay, thank you. I'm gonna withdraw the thing about the vote, but what I'm gonna say is, Julio, you've put in uh, the 2018 New Jersey law that you had just talked about. There's other stuff I'm assuming that you have knowledge of that you would send. Mm -hmm. So I think what the next step might be then is for you to get that packet to me and Mm -hmm. I disseminate it among everyone. Um, So that does that sound right to you as well, Representative Arsenault? Yeah, and and I think this conversation is really helpful. Uh, I'd love to know if, I don't know, and now Chair Lalonde is here, so he could guide me and if I'm straying in the wrong direction. But um, if the decision is to, I mean, I, if the decision is to support legislation in, in this universe, mm-hmm. um, I'd love to work with sure. the panel or a, a representative, someone who's empowered by the panel, you know, to, to craft that, to, to refine it once, uh, you know, to make a request of legislative council and then review the draft and just what how, you know how i'm used to um working on on drafts okay. they get introduced um and i love the idea of uh including in that you know a, tr- a legislative training um adding this to legislate which we have lots of different trainings you know that we do i think at least three or four that i can think of off the top of my head that every session it's not just like new it's not orientation i'm not talking about when you're a new legislator i'm saying every year uh training on the tool or something like that so yeah i'd love to to uh, identify someone in the group if uh, who would like to i'm not saying right now but you know just know who to we'll get there partner with yep absolutely derek you're going to be kind of like the last word because representative lalonde is here i'll 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 keep it brief you you already addressed procedurally one of the things that i was going to express was the if this was a vote that needed to be warned and so on and so forth. So we're not voting, fine. I would personally be interested in just also learning more about whether or not, like so many things, this ends up being weaponized against the BIPOC community in the states that do use it, whether it becomes the, uh, you know, the attribution for otherwise what would be framed as positive progress that doesn't happen, so on and so forth. So, you know, I just would personally 
be really interested in anyone who knows how these things have sort of sociologically manifested because I suspect that there's been an underbelly to their uh, implementation, unfortunately, because if, if, if the dominant system thought this was a necessary thing, right, it would, we'd be doing this. So just, uh, you know, it gave me a little pause for thought too. It's like, so that's it. Thank you. I'm out. Okay. So be on the lookout for a mailing with lots of attachments, I think. <laughs> um, and we'll start there. Um, representative, you and I can be in touch at some point as the months go on. And I'll be in touch, obviously, with everybody on the panel. I'll just facilitate. Sound good? Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Okay, great. So that's where we are with that. And now the, the, <laughs> hi, Representative Lalonde. This will be fun. <laughs> Hello. Uh, how are you nice, doing? Nice, nice to be here. It's been too long since I yeah. joined your meetings. And, but I've had an excellent person who has been sitting in. Uh, in yeah. Ann, so, yes, yes, absolutely. The issue, and of course, we've been dealing with this now for a while, but I and I am really good at looking at all of the cross conflicting issues and being stymied at coming up with anything that sounds like a really good solution. But of course, what we're talking about is being able to look at those bills that come up that you've actually been identifying as having an equity impact, looking at them through an equity lens. You have been doing that on the House Judiciary. Um, and unfortunately, there were several times this session we just couldn't do it because of how everything is constituted. This is where I start getting in a thicket. We need to have better communication so we can have time to con consider these things, meet as a panel, and get testimony where it needs to go. On the other hand, it's a citizen legislature, which doesn't meet full time. So that makes that a very difficult proceeding in many ways, because there's not a lot of time. On the other hand, it is essential, I think. Um, it's certainly what everyone wanted in the session before last, the RDAP to do, was that kind of work. Um, you know, just be able to like the ACLU, like, ODG, like, I don't know, who else? The Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, you know, to come in and be able to give reasoned, thoughtful, analytical, rigorous testimony on these various bills. And then I get lost because I just go, okay, the bills that we should be looking at, we should start looking at probably now. And they're not written. There's no way they're written by now. So anyway, I'm just putting out there the mess that my little brain gets into when I can start on down this road, trying to figure out a solution so that we don't really repeat last session. So I'm I'm happy to hear those solutions. Uh, oh, or... God. Yeah, you and me both. Um... <laughs> so, I mean, I can I can offer uh, some ideas, certainly, and um but are they going to be are they going to uh s systemically fix the issue probably right. not because these are uh, these ideas are going to be based on who's on the committee right now uh and so so uh Angela and I and and a couple other uh members of the committee we're we're working on uh, having meetings uh, with various stakeholders that we deal with throughout the year, uh, the courts, state's attorney, defenders, ACLU, victims, advocates, the network, uh, others as well, uh, so that we can have uh, bill drafting requests in, uh, hopefully when, as soon as the um, Legislative Council starts working on those bills, which isn't until September at the earliest, because they have a lot of other off-session duties, such as updating the green books and, and the like. 
Uh, so we are working to try to have an idea of what our priorities are going to be uh, going into next session. And frankly, we I don't set those priorities. I, I mean, I, on my own, I talk to people who are working in the field. And and I had a conversation last week with Mark Hughes as one of uh, one of the, those conversations um, for the Racial Justice Alliance. And and we are going to have more conversations. Um, I, I know that uh, the Office of Racial Equity is on my list. Susanna, you will be hearing from me uh, to to get your input on that. So so we are trying, given given what you know occurred, and uh, to to try to understand what we're going to be dealing with uh, as far as priorities. Having said that, things are going to come up because that's just the bills that. Angela, Karen Dolan, uh, Barbara Rachelson, and I, and others in our committee will likely sponsor and and will be working on. But then there are other priorities that are are shoved down on us uh, that that we may not know about until we see uh, what bills there are and what has become salient. You know, there are right. issues that all of a sudden have to be dealt with. Those are the more complicated ones. But to the extent that we understand what we're going to be doing or trying to do, uh, getting your input early is is helpful. So I'll just use as, as an example, uh, something that I already understand is a priority because it's a carryover from last year. Uh, and that's dealing with some of the issues in juvenile justice. Uh, there, there's a, 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 um, a study, I know studies sound horrible, but a working group uh, that we uh, created in, um, Act number 125, I think that was S58, I think, uh, working group on transfers of juvenile proceedings from the family division to the criminal division. And the idea behind that is we would like to see all juvenile cases start in the family division. And if they're uh, a big 12, you know, one of the worst type crimes, have an expedited way that they can be moved to the criminal division. But we want a cooling off period to to allow it to be thoughtful instead of having like we saw in Addison County uh, an inappropriate case in my view going to criminal court and once it's in criminal court you know yeah. it it's over so anyway that's one of the things we're looking at doing we're also I I see in one of your recommendations increasing the delinquency age to to twelve yeah that could be part of that so already have some of your input on that but. But that's something we already have a bill request in for and and the language. But we're waiting. Uh, you know, actually, this report is not due till December 15th. But but you understand that this is something we would be looking for. But we are, you know, there are other things that we are working. And as soon as we kind of understand that we have some bills and, and I think the one that you were just talking about with Angela is another example. Uh, that there will be a bill request in for that. That's not necessarily one going to my committee, uh, as far as as far as that policy uh, uh, analysis. I'm sorry, I forgot what the name was already, and I was listening, and, and I have it right in front of, and I have it right in front of me for policy. For, uh, was assessment. provided as an example uh, for the uh electronic monitoring and and we we definitely looked at that we used that and we changed what we did with electronic monitoring uh in in the bill uh s195 because of the input that we got from uh defender's office the office of racial equity as well and aclu any of that the point is that we are trying to figure out some of those things and that's one part of it but how do we deal with the uh, things that come in emergency i think I need to do a better job of making sure that as soon as I understand it's happening to get a hold of you. And, and I will admit there were a couple of times in the heat of the moment of the 12 weeks that we have starting in early January to get all of our bills out uh, that I dropped the ball and will do better as making sure as soon as I understand something might be coming on the agenda to let you know. But that still may not work given the timing, you know, that there's three months and you have three meetings and we have a dozen bills. So right. what can I do to help you? Um, so I, I, I mean, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I think the input, I mean, I look back at, at, at maybe, 
I mean, we we I look at where we've had really great success with yeah. Doug. And but that was in uh, the Division of Racial uh, Justice Statistics. And that was a two year, at least a two year project. Yeah. Uh, and 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 our DAP was critical in, in getting that over the finish line. Uh, but that's that. Well, that is not necessarily the, the exception. I think the work that our DAP is doing and I know we're probably a ways away on uh, the second look legislation because there's a lot of questions still out there. Uh, but there may be, you know, is is our DAP. Is RDAP the best entity? You know, let's think really big here. Is it RDAP the best entity uh, for us to go to to get input uh, on those kind of bills that are coming up, or is it this is the big issue that we need to work on for uh, for uh, juvenile justice and, and racial equity, and, and we have a two year frame to really get it right. Uh, it's not one of those things that we we feel that we really have to react because of all the other pressures that we're dealing with. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. I mean, I'd like to I'd like to get input. Uh, and I and and the other thing I will say, and at the end of the this is a little bit different, but I'll get it out there before I forget, is uh, at the end of the session and kind of evaluating and thinking what we did well and didn't do well. And there's a lot of things I think we did do well. We did not do as good of a job of getting impacted uh, communities in to testify on some of the bills. And we do have to do better than that. That's one of the things I talked to Mark Hughes about last week. Uh, and, and that's not going necessarily through an organization that meets once a month, but going to other others as well. Uh, migrant justice, we I don't think reached out to them nearly enough this past session. Uh, I will take uh, the blame for that. Uh, Racial Justice Alliance, et cetera. Um, any event, I, I'm open to hear from other folks what we can what we can do to improve what we're doing with that. I have to say right off the bat, I love the idea of being able to have a time frame that we all have that we can look at and go, okay, this is a two year thing. And that we can start on it at year A and get it into year B. And of course, what you had just asked becomes relevant at that because are we going to talk about every little thing or are we talking about the big overarching issues that seem to kind of frame a session in some ways? Um, so that's a question that needs to be answered. But I love the, just off the bat, just some kind of framework that puts us more in sync with what the legislature is doing. Because I think one of the things that was truly kind of disarming last session was I, I at least felt like we were working, I don't know where, <laughs> somewhere. I wasn't sure it mattered at some moments, to be fair. I mean, I really was just kind of like, this is bizarre. I mean, you know, I normally I feel like everyone on Senate judiciary is on speed dial. I didn't hear from them once. Um, and with some bills that are pretty tricky around racial e equity and such, that was concerning and it became kind of contradictory given what had gone on around the division of racial justice statistics. Sorry, saying that with a fake tooth is like practically impossible. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, we had that time. You're right. We had two years on that one and that made it much easier. If we had to cram that into one, oh my God. I mean, I don't even know. We can't. It's a volunteer panel, you know, I mean, how are we going to get that going? Um, so I guess that's what I'm saying is just that I like the idea of the broader framework of time that we would share. Right, right. Yeah. And I, I think we may we may be set up to do that a little bit better uh, this time. Uh, you know, I'm I'm expecting to have some uh, continuity in, in uh, the Judiciary Committee. 
uh, and you know, we're able to kind of look ahead a little bit more. You know, frankly, it was a big learning process for not just me, but a lot of the committee members this uh, past biennium, uh, and and we've learned certainly some lessons. So, okay. Uh, Susanna, you have your hand up, and then oh, Judge Morris. No, never mind. Okay, <laughs> Susanna. Thank you. I just wanted to add, uh, I know it was alluded to already, but I, 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 I appreciate what the representative is saying. And I also just want to add that even in the time, this past session, one of the challenges that I think a lot of us experienced was that even those times where we were in the room, I think the treatment of people was, um, was really bad, even when we could get the timing right and, you know, get in the door before crossover or, or what have you. I mean, I um, had, I had people calling up my staff saying, congratulations, welcome to the club of people Dick Sears has yelled at, you know, and, and it's, this is not the kind of thing that we should be forming reputations or quirky trauma clubs over. Um, and, and I think that it discourages participation, particularly from community groups or members of the public for whom it may be a first time showing up at all. I've heard from other members of the legislature who said that they and any witnesses they tried to bring in were roundly dismissed, were uh, invited to a hearing and then made to wait for a long time to testify and then told afterwards, you won't be heard. Have a nice day. Sorry, you took off work. Um, and I think that that is, um, it, it is really hard for us to reconcile that kind of thing with the novelty of saying we're sitting legislature of the people. Um, so that's not a critique of present company, but it is something that we noticed very roundly in this past session, and it definitely left a mark on our on our team. And so that's something that in the future, um, I think makes a lot of us very leery of, of continued collaboration, even when we are looped in at the right times. And I just wanna make sure that it's, that we're, we're understanding that there's that hemisphere to it too. Not just that we're um, notified, but also that when we are and when we're there, are we actually being heard or handled? Mm. Mm. Can I just comment on that? that just first, first of all, Susanna, is that if if we ever, at least in my committee, and it should be any committee, if you ever are hearing that that's happening, I certainly want to know. Uh, I, I know that I, I have, even within the committee, I know that uh, Angela, for instance, has alerted me uh, to a couple of times where uh, where the witness hasn't been treated uh, as well as it uh, should have been. Uh, and it just in the heat of the moment, I, I may have missed something. Uh, but definitely let me know if that's happening in my committee. And, and you should definitely let... Uh, let the chair know on other committees as well. Uh, and if you're, cause that, that's something that I really w don't want to have happen. And, and I don't think it happens, uh, but I may be missing it uh, in, in our judiciary committee. Uh, you know, for, for instance, I've, I, I do believe that maybe somebody was a little bit harsh in questioning uh, uh, Jay and one of the, one of the times he was in front of us. Uh, but I, hopefully I, I, talk to him and uh, other uh, and other times and really have appreciated his input. And like I mentioned even earlier, his his testimony has affected some of the bills that we've gotten, for instance, from the Senate that that we have modified and maybe not enough uh, for for folks to fully appreciate it. But but we have taken uh, the input from the uh, from your office uh, to heart and really have tried to compromise and, and deal with our bills for that. But going back, I mean, if there's ever anything like that, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to me because we, we do want to do better. Uh, so. Thank you, Representative. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that it, it, it led us to really talk about internally was the fact that there is not really a clear protocol for that because the legislature as of only very recently has an HR, but they don't handle that. Um, and, you know, oftentimes when it's member misconduct, people are directed to the speaker or the pro tem, um, which has its own eyebrow raising aspects to it. And then of course, if you're a member of the administration, you have an HR, but they're not gonna do anything about the legislature creating a hostile work environment. Um, 
And even if they could, that doesn't help members of the public who aren't state of Vermont employees. So it seems to me that there's a giant procedural gap in how this kind of thing gets addressed. And I, I appreciate that you as a chair of your committee um, don't want to tolerate mistreatment of witnesses and you do want to be notified. And I wish that all the chairs were like that. So for those committees um, whose chair does not share your sentiments and your dedication to that, that's a problem. And, and so this isn't for this group to, to resolve, but I think it's uh, a big conversation that needs to be had about who who's, res who's responsible. I had not this session, but last session, um, both Executive Director Davis and I were giving testimony to a, I'm trying to be respectful here and not make unfounded allegations. Um, it was around the Division of Racial Justice Statistics. Um, there had been, a, it was a real rush to get some stuff done. We, I, I don't even remember how the RDAP did it. We did it. We somehow did it. Um, and I walked in on what, that day and here was the bill. And I, you know, I said, here's what came from the RDAP. And in particular, what was significant was something that came out from Witchy, who is in fact an expert. And it was about data and it was about staffing and so on. Um, part of that bill is something on which I'm an expert, which is sort of the, what's the word? Let's just say I've filled out a lot of human relations uh, forms over the years to do my research. And um, you really need to consult with the group that you're the group or groups that you're looking at and dealing with when you're collecting data. So I had brought this in. And then after I did that, the next day we had to come back because it was going to be the final version and walked in and a really major part of this bill of the division of racial justice statistics a really major part of that had disappeared it had just disappeared in the space of what 18 hours maybe um and the only reason i knew that it had disappeared was because i signed on early and there was a read through and i was like you got to be kidding me and so i then started up and i just went you know um, executive director Davis spoke first than I did. And I said, um, with a lot of dismay in my voice, I said, I am just dismayed and angered by this. Where did this go? I mean, you know, this is something that's required by, you know, this field, that field, that field, but not the Vermont legislature. I mean, how, how does that work? I don't understand. You asked for feedback from us. We gave you feedback with subject matter experts. And you just decided, no, we're not going to do that. I said, well, then there's no point in really doing this. I mean, it had to do with um, people having the right to talk about what data is going to be collected and how it's going to be used and so on. Um, that's just a commonplace in social science. Um, and what then happened was I got yelled at for yelling, which I thought was really interesting because I was not yelling, but I then kind of wanted to go into, you know, it was that moment of, well, black men, when they get a little feisty, you know, <laughs> we're all yelling suddenly, um, which means I'm yelling all the time. Um, cause I just am like that kind of passionate. And it, I was going to let it go because I'm so used to this after 60 years on this planet. And Executive Director Davis was like, uh, no, <laughs> and took the member of the committee to task for it. But the problem is exactly what she has just mentioned, which is I could not do anything with this. I could not go to anyone in the Senate who would have been in a position to have stopped this. 
and that was because of the position of this person. And I just like went, okay. Um, luckily, she opened her mouth and put him right where he needed to be. And that worked very well. Um, and life moved on. But that's another issue with all of this is there's this, it's very hard to be a person of color and not, not get conspiratorial, frankly. I'm just going to put that out there. It's hard to talk about posters about equity impact assessments just sort of disappearing. And it's hard to talk about those the kind of conversation I'm describing and not see a broader pattern that's written back on, you know, race relations in the United States for hundreds of years. And it makes it very difficult at that point to know what to do. That's another issue, but it's related to this, I think. Um, I would love to see things in September, even just hints of things in September. I mean, anybody else? Y'all are here too. Anybody else got an idea? Y'all got full-time jobs and got to read the same stuff I got to read. So feel free to fill in. Or not. <laughs> and and I want to throw one more thing out there just for managing of expectations as well. So, um, so Angela and uh, a, kind of a core group that I know will be back in my committee uh, or all things suggest that they will be, uh, we're going to be trying to work on, on figuring out some of our priorities, but that is just our priorities, which will be very important because we're in that room and, and get to guide that. But uh, not until after the election, after the election, the majority caucus uh, poll, has meetings, polls all the caucus members and draw from the caucus what one of the what the caucus priorities are. In fact, that's really what drove uh, our work this past session was that public safety hit the very top and everybody was hearing about it and we had to deal with it. And uh, you know, I will say the one thing that we really pushed to have part of that discussion, which came from within the committee, was making sure that we were expanding uh, diversion and the, the whole pre-charge work that we did. So, so we were able to fit that in to what the caucus was telling us. I think that's tamped down this year. I think that that we may be flying under the radar largely in the Judiciary Committee. I think everybody's going to be focusing on education and housing and climate some important issues and also have lots of equity issues, obviously in those as well. But as far as with the, the judiciary, I think that we're gonna be able to set that uh, priorities a little bit more. And, and we are gonna be trying to do this as soon as we can. And, and when we start learning that, uh, we'll let you know. Okay. I'm, I'm, I am really hoping that in September, we're gonna get started on, uh, cause I want our legislative council to be starting to work on these bills so that they'll be ready when we get there in January. Great. Sounds great. Anybody else got something more intelligent to say than great? Rebecca does. Go for it. <laughs> I, I feel like this is the moment to to um, do a plug for RDAP's past reports uh, and, 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 and understanding what, what you're sharing in terms of, of deciding what will be the priority uh, bills to push forward on the session from the perspective of RDAP uh, to the extent that, that um, and I know you already shared that you intend to, to set a meeting with Aton, uh, but to the extent you want to hear what RDAP has previously identified as the policy priorities, uh, suggestions in addressing and correcting uh, racism and the, and the juvenile justice system, you have that. And, and how many reports have we done Aton, so I just want to make sure that's back up. On your uh, at this point, four. And this panel was put together in late 2017. If if juvenile justice is shaping up to be a priority, just so generally speaking, 
the details yet to be fleshed out that as, as Eitan said is really helpful for us to know because we can guide, we can uh, come back and, and pull out if that's helpful uh, aspects of juvenile justice reform proposals that RF has done in the past. Uh, we can, if, if our agenda item number two of, of, uh, is of, of priority interest, that would help motivate us and help us prioritize what our agenda items will be month to month on RDAP, uh, what we commit to. Right now, we have some discussion going on on the books relating to, to secure facilities and, and rest stops, uh, just so you know, in the next couple months. Um, and then this uh, racial justice uh, impact toolkit uh, really are two. Uh, but if that's not something that you think is going to have uh, be taken off the wall this year, maybe second year, that would be helpful to know as as yeah. Ayala said, shaping the bigger and getting to the details. Or if you think it can actually move fast, how how quickly we should focus that as a high priority would be helpful. Uh, and and I want to make sure I understood what you said as far as uh, the racial impact analysis. Is that what you're um, yeah. So, so with that, again, that's not, that probably is not in Judiciary Committee's jurisdiction. So we need to start the conversation with probably government operations, I would think, uh, and, and uh, start that conversation with uh, Mike McCarthy. Uh, that, that definitely is a, a, a biennium project, you know, because because that that's a pretty significant change uh, in many respects, uh, making it mandatory. I think absolutely the questions that uh, are in this uh, analysis are, in fact, often the ones that we're trying to answer. But I understand the need to formalize this. Um, so any event, but so so it, it will the kind of as a focus that I'm trying to get a handle on on the juvenile justice. And I mentioned a couple of things I won't reiterate. Uh, one is from the the study that we're expecting, but I think I might even start the drafting before I even get the results from that study. Uh, so and 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 the other is from your recommendations that uh, from your February report. Uh, and I think a couple of the res recommendations, I'm not sure if they're as much uh, the second recommendation regarding the data collection, if that is more a formal request from us to the rules committee uh, that as opposed to legislation. But I need to look at that a little further because when we've made those requests, they, they do tend to follow up uh, on, on those requests. Uh, but the other thing is, just so you know, and I don't know how much uh, RDAP would, would weigh in on this, is part of that, the overlap is in juvenile justice with Chin's docket and with uh, the uh, termination of parental rights. Uh, that's all kind of what I'm hoping that the committee is going to spend some time with, because it's been a while since we've done that. And I've heard some rumblings of some issues uh, in, in those areas. So just want to flag that. But but there'll be more to come as we Great. start really talking to people. Okay, thank you. Now we've got like six minutes, so the three people who've got their hands up now, let's have them. No, Elizabeth, you can't go away now. Um, Judge Morrissey, you're first. <laughs> Very quickly, and I'm just throwing this out. Maybe as a suggestion for a future topic is that. I mean, the legislative session is for a very defined period of time. We know what that time period is. And then because we just talked about earlier that in the summer, sometimes it's hard to get people here. I'm wondering if it may make sense to front load a couple more meetings in the during the legislative session and maybe not have a couple meetings in the summer. So that way it would give us more time to consider some of these issues that come up. So I'm just throwing that out as a suggestion. That is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Really, <laughs> uh, Sheila. Um, not a bad suggestion. I just wanted to take a moment, Aton, and just respond to you and what you just shared of you and Susanna's experiences. WTF, everyone. Yeah. Um, the response. I expected <laughs> from especially legislators were like, oh, let me go check my buddies because I've got some work to do. doesn't matter what committee, what role, what whatever, y'all y'all together, right? And so that was deep. Um, doesn't surprise me whatsoever. 
Uh, I'm very happy that you shared your experience um, because I've definitely had my own. Um, and um, yeah, I wish the response was different um, to acknowledge what Aton just said and to actually want to commit to being different and doing different and checking the people that you work side by side every day with. Um, I'm just like, mm. and I, um, and I everybody do process is different. So I'm going to leave it like that. So can, that's, that's can, okay. But I'm just going to express my thoughts that we just moved on real quickly to something when there were some deep thoughts that just came out hmm. and some deep disrespect of people doing a lot of work, specifically black folks and people of color doing a lot of work that's benefiting all of you and all of us. And so I'm, I'm just, you know, thank you, Aton. Appreciate it. You're welcome. And, and if I could just uh, real quickly apologize. Sure. And uh, Sheila, I, I've, back when this happened, I know that I talked uh, to Aton about this. And, and if I'm recalling right, it was not in the house, uh, if I'm, maybe I'm misremembering, or it was the appropriations committee. It wasn't was, the house. Yeah, and and frankly, the senators don't generally listen to uh, house yeah. members. Uh, and, and if it was something that happened in the house, uh, I definitely would have, and, and I apologize that I didn't speak up, that I, I did know of the situation, Sheila, and, and, and Aton and I have talked about it before. Susanna, why don't yeah, you bring I it just be before oh. I, before I'm sorry, Susanna. I just want to respond to that. This is a human thing. This isn't a this isn't like a this this that thing <laughs> house over here thing. This is a human thing. And don't matter where you sit, where you at, like that don't make sense to me right now as a response. No disrespect. Susanna? Do you want to bring us home? Yeah, I'm, I apologize. In the beginning of the meeting when we did announcements, I was not fully here. So I, I forgot to mention I have an announcement, which is uh, our office has a number of open positions right now. Uh, so I'm just going to put those in the chat. Um, please feel free to share them widely. One of them is for the second analyst in the Division of Racial Justice Statistics. That one did just close yesterday. We got a whopping 160 some odd applicants. Oh. No, they're not bots, because that's what I thought. Um, ah. So a lot of talent to sift through. Um, and the other two are closing soon. So please feel free to share those widely. The second thing I wanted to mention was last, last session, the legislature asked the uh, RDAP to do a report on the cannabis. Cannabis control. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Social Equity Business Development Fund. And um, we, of course, were immersed in our other, the biennial report. And so um, the legislature has now assigned that work to a different set of people. Um, the CCB is to be working in consultation with Office of Racial Equity and ACCD and somebody else um, to put that together and that group, if anybody is interested, I believe it's an open meeting. The first one is going to be Wednesday, the 21st um, at 3 p.m. And that's hosted by the CCB office. And I, I think it's an open meeting because it'll have a quorum of the CCB members present. Um, so just in case anybody's interested in following that topic, the thread was picked up and that's um, moving. Okay. Um. Thank you all. This has been profoundly productive, I feel. I mean, I, you know, you want to finish it up and solve it all right now, but this is Earth. Um, but thank you for what's been a, just three extremely productive, I think, conversations, one of which I didn't expect, um, or I did, and then I didn't, then <laughs> there we are. Does anyone have anything new that they want to bring up at this point? Um, like, you know, a little thing <laughs> or a big thing said literally, Elizabeth. Yeah, I will just say, um, this is, I, I should have said this probably of the announcements, but um, I'm actually leaving DCF. I've taken a new position 
with uh, BDH. So I just wanted to share that this is actually- We're not allowing that, no. a lot of time here, um, but I'm, I'm excited. This position um, is with uh, the Division of uh, Substance Use within BDH and doing health equity work. So very excited to continue um, with, this, with this trend. Congratulations, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, again, thank you all. Um, and we, let's see, our next meeting is the 10th of September. Uh, oh, Representative Arsenault. I'm it's sorry. Super, don't be. It's a super little thing that I meant to say when I introduced myself. I just wanted to say it's really nice to see you, Officer Manning. Um, I missed you last year in the State House. It's great to see your face. Thank you. It's good to see you also. No, they'll be here a lot. <laughs> so then I guess we're set. Expect emails. Um, And thank you all again for a very productive meeting. Thank you for bearing with me in the middle of a migraine. Um, Thank you, Sheila, for signing in from vacation. Um, I, Just thanks to everybody. I really appreciate all of you, all of you tremendously. So be well.